All right. Hello, my friends, and welcome back to another episode of the Health Detective Podcast by Functional Diagnostic Nutrition. My name is Evan Transu, a.k.a. Detective Ev, and I will be your, your co-host, really, for today's show, not the official host. I would call it a co-host. This is episode number two of Lunch and Learn, and I think for convenience sake, if you're listening on audio, I think I might have put a real episode number into this last time, but I, I think it's going to get too messy trying to include this in the normal like episode 300 something, whatever we're on. I'd rather do these as the numbers of the lunch and learn so that you can keep track and stay tuned with the stuff if you want to do that. Um, new releases, right? These are new on every Tuesday. We're going to be doing this. We might have to mix, uh, miss April 23rd of 2024, just so you guys know, because of a scheduling conflict. But after that, we should be pretty much good to go to do these every single week. So we appreciate everyone that hopped on the first time and gave us such positive feedback and engaged with us. It immediately encouraged us to do this once a week instead of once every two weeks. So the podcast, remember, on Monday and Thursday, at least on the audio side, will still have the normal interviews, normal releases that we've been doing for three years straight. Nothing changes there. Just This is just an additional add-on on Tuesdays. So Lucy, welcome to the show. I'm really excited that we get to do this every week. Right. It's so good to just to get to hang out and chat with you. It's fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, we were having plenty of fun before this live. That's for sure. So well, uh, that's for another time. Yeah. All right. We are in lunch and learn number two, as I said. <laughs> so lunch and learn number one, we introduced the concept of lunch and learn, but we also talked about HPA access dysregulation, HPA access dysfunction. We talked about the different stages of it, and we talked about how we believed at FDN, it's a much better and more accurate phrasing than what is uh, popularly been called out in functional and natural medicine for a while as adrenal fatigue. It's becoming less popular, but we definitely believe HPA access dysfunction is more accurate. So uh, Lucy, I was kind of hoping in the beginning of this one, we could just summarize this a little bit for people who might not have been on. Um, I'll talk about some of the, the phases. I'll, I'll throw it to you first though. H how do we define HPA access dysfunction and how might it differ a little bit from adrenal fatigue? So we break it down into uh, four stages at FDM. We've got your optimal, which is homeostasis. That's, you know, that's the goal. That's where everybody wants to be. Um, and then we've got your acute phase where actually uh, you might not know that anything is going on at this point. Um, that's due to like a higher amount of cortisol level being pumped through your body. So you've got a lot of energy, you'll go, go, go all the time. Um, a lot of people don't notice they're in this phase when they're in this phase because they feel pretty good. Um, next, we've got the compensatory phase. This is when you actually might start to kind of notice that there is something going on. Your cortisol levels are beginning to slide down. So you might be making up with for it by, you know, drinking extra coffee, your energy drinks in the morning, things like that. That's a really common one that I have a pet peeve with energy drinks. Um, but you're, you're basically um, self medicating to kind of keep yourself going. Um, and then the phase after that is exhaustive. This is you don't want to be in your phase. This is when your cortisol levels are tanked, you're really low, you're tired all the time, you're getting a lot of um, symptoms. It's not just fatigue because kind of your other sex hormones are probably going bananas at this point, probably feeling really low. And you're dealing with a lot of symptoms that we often in now times, modern days, like think, you know, it just happens with aging. We're getting tired. There's low sex drive. Perhaps you've got, you know, your skin is not what you want it to be. Perhaps like me, you're suffering with bad mental health, things like that. But it's all things that we kind of put down to as life, normal, um, and that's what we really want to, um, want to help people understand that it's not normal to be in any of these phases except for homeostasis basically. And that is the goal at FDN to help you get back into homeostasis, into that optimal phase. Right. And when we talk about HPA axis dysfunction, what that means is hypothalamic pituitary adrenal access dysfunction. So the reason that we believe at FDN that adrenal fatigue is an incomplete way to talk about what's happening to people is one, the adrenals are only one organ system, right? And a lot of the times when you look at how they are interacting with other things in the body, it's a secondary or tertiary issue. Uh, very rarely do you see adrenal issues being a primary issue. Although if you were going to see it in anything, you can make an argument that something like Addison's disease, which is an autoimmune disease of the um, adrenals, that 
could be a primary issue. But even then, if you're looking at it from an FDN perspective, we would never, ever say that an autoimmune condition is not preceded by something else happening, right? It's not as simple as that. So with that all said, the reason that we focus on this is because uh, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal access actually implies that there's a lot more going on with your body and it makes a lot more sense as to why people are experiencing so many symptoms when they're chronically ill. Because if we're focusing on that axis, well, then we also need to focus on a few other things. There's the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. There's the hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis. There's actually quite a few things here. And we can have more of a direct effect, especially with lifestyle changes, on the function of the hypothalamus and pituitary. It's really cool. We mentioned last time, uh, one of my favorite topics is light and circadian biology. And I will never forget this spark of like fireworks went off in my head when I made this connection. I had already learned about HPA access dysfunction and FDN. And approximately two years later or something, I was studying light and circadian biology. And I learned that the SCN, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, is in the hypothalamus. So the suprachiasmatic nucleus is like your internal clock. That's the primary clock. That's the one that's really affected by light, artificial blue light and a sunrise. So good and bad. And I was like, wow, how many people are feeling these uh, different stages of HPA axis dysfunction or experiencing these stages because of bad light and not just because of diet and other things, although those things are absolutely implicated in it. So I think that's uh, probably a pretty solid review. We're already seven minutes into the review, but it, it's really cool. And I would say to be an FDN or to understand FDN, you need to understand this concept. This is something that we come back to all the time. Mm -hmm. With that all said, as we go along in these lunch and learns, it's not like we're teaching you everything in FDN. That'd be ridiculous and impractical. And we couldn't do that for free, unfortunately. But we are kind of going through to the best of our ability in a logical order here. So what we did talk about last time is also our stress and hormones profile. This is a test that was created custom for us by a company called Fluids IQ. So it's the Fluids IQ SHP. And some people were pleasantly surprised to find, wait a second, you guys primarily use saliva hormone testing in your FDN practices. And that is the case. It's what we teach in the FDN course. There's a variety of reasons for this, and we are going to break down some of those today. So uh, Lucy and I have some notes this time because we wanted to make sure that we cover everything for you guys in these lunch and learns. It's not quite as free flow as some of the interviews might be. So I'll start off with uh, point A here, if I may, Lucy, just going right across our list. So hey. one of the things about saliva that needs to be understood compared to blood or compared to urine testing is that it takes an accurate look at the free fraction levels of the hormone. So this is the hormone when it's not binded to something else, and it means that it's active as well. So why does this matter? Well, one, that's only like two to 3% of the hormone, basically. At that point, it's about two to 3% of it. So it doesn't seem like a lot. But what we know about these active forms of the hormone is that they are highly correlated with the person's symptoms. And if you understand FDN, you understand something called clinical correlation. Now, depending on what branch of medicine you're in, you might define clinical correlation a little bit differently. How we're defining it at FDN is this is basically what we do. This is not diagnostic. This is not diagnosing, I should say. But this is what we do as opposed to diagnosing and treating. If someone saw adrenal output, for example, or cortisol output that was tanked, that's when you might start meeting the criteria for something like Addison's disease that I just brought up. Now, of course, if we really saw it that tanked, we are trained as FDNs to refer out if we thought or suspected something like that. Most of the time, what we're seeing is very low, but not tanked to the point of it being something that you can even diagnose. So that's an issue, right? Even if they went to Western medicine, they couldn't get the diagnosis, but something is wrong with them. Income uh, in comes clinical correlation. So what we're able to do is go over the test results with our clients and we can actually, with almost perfect accuracy, it's incredible, we can kind of guess how they're feeling at different parts of the day 
based on these results. So I might be able to look at them and say, oh, I, I guarantee you actually wake up pretty well and feel okay. They might be like, yeah, but once you get to that afternoon, you're the person, oh my God, you need the nap, your brain fogged, you're not focusing, all that stuff. They're like, uh-huh. You know, they got the head nod going on. They're loving it. So the clinical correlation part is really important to us. And that's one of the reasons that we're using saliva because the active form of the hormones are most associated with the symptoms that the person is experiencing. So that is the first point as to why we would use saliva as opposed to blood or urine. And there's quite a few more. So um, I'll shut up. And I'm actually going to pull up some cortisol results while you're talking about the second point, Lucy. Oh, fantastic. Um, so I'm looking at your notes. So the second point um, is that and obviously now, I think originally like back in the day, like saliva used to be... Um, Sorry, I'm looking in the right place. I was like, where am I looking? Uh, <laughs> saliva used to be kind of seen as, uh, like it was kind of discounted. It, it wasn't uh, It wasn't seen as like a valid form, uh, like a valid test. Um, however, since, you know, back in the day, we we're 20 years later, we're, we're now talking about, there's been hundreds of studies that have um, shown the validity of, of saliva. And it, it is now considered one of the, the gold standards of testing. And it's a cheap, easy way to test. Um, another really great form, I hope you don't mind if I go on to the next point, but um, we're looking at um, the circadian rhythm. Now, your circadian rhythm is basically your sleep-wake cycle. So we want to measure cortisol throughout the day to get an accurate map of what is going on in your body. Just so, as I've mentioned before, so that you can be like, Okay, so your your cortisol is really high in the morning. So perhaps you're feeling stressed in the morning, but you're really tired at 12 p.m. You can basically track how you know someone's circadian rhythm is, is working throughout the day based on those cortisol measurements. And the reason that we do that with saliva is because for a start, it's a lot easier to test with saliva than something like blood. Um, requiring someone to go to the doctor four times a day to have a blood draw is impractical it's extremely stressful um and it's probably quite expensive i've not had blood drawn four times in one day but i imagine that is uh has a decent cost that comes with it also with the times that we need to measure so as you can see and it's got the little chart going on here um if you're waking up at six in the morning it's pretty hard to get down to the lab and, and get your blood drawn and the same um for the nighttime uh draw as well obviously it might be easy during the day uh, but nighttime, you're supposed to um, do the test in low light so it doesn't affect like your melatonin levels um, or cause any spikes in, in cortisol unnecessarily. Um, and it's just it's just easier. I don't know about you, Ev, but I, I definitely prefer using saliva than going for a blood draw. It's more convenient. It's here in, at my house uh, rather than me having to go out and go get it done. Yeah. And what I, I love what Reed brings up in the course about how blood testing is stressful for a lot of people and cortisol reacts very quickly, right? When you're stressed, it instantly can spike. So it can lead to a lot of inaccurate readings to the point that when we're doing the saliva tests with our clients, one of the things that we educate them on is we don't want them doing this on a day where they're doing exercise that exceeds just normal walking. Uh, right. We don't want them doing this when they had an extreme abnormal stressor, like maybe they just lost their job or uh, gosh forbid someone passed away. That's not the time to be testing this because that's not your life normally. Um, we also try to advise them away from caffeine, although you can make an argument that if they're always drinking caffeine, then perhaps the abstinence from it will actually cause a stress response. <laughs> because they're, stress. they're addicted to it. So f fair enough on that one. But definitely this is not the day to go do a HIIT workout or do a 19 mile hike or do a two hour weightlifting session or play three hours of basketball, that's not what you would be doing on uh, a day that you're testing for something like this because saliva, regardless of what it is, it could artificially spike the results, but certainly blood work in and of itself is stressful for a lot of people. I wouldn't even say I'm someone who minds it, but I definitely, it's one of those things that I'd rather not be getting my blood drawn. <laughs> you know what I mean? Whereas yeah. saliva, it's more of an inconvenience, but it's not 
a stressor. So the results that I, or the chart, I should say that I shared on the screen is not from FDN. I just did a quick Google search to pull one up for you guys. So shout out to ZRT Laboratory, so I don't get copyright here. Uh, but this is overall accurate enough for what we're talking about today. When we're doing these four samples, it's not just cortisol, by the way. We look at a lot of things. We're looking at estrogen. We're looking at testosterone. We're looking at melatonin. But cortisol is one of the big things that we're looking at. And we're trying to see what the diurnal rhythm for your cortisol is. So just like you've heard of a circadian rhythm, your cortisol kind of operates on that same circadian rhythm, or at least it should. And so if you're able to see the graph, um, you can look at it right now. If you're on audio, no worries. I'll still describe it to you. So basically what you're seeing on here is in the morning, you have a significant a relative spike. It's like a giant hump compared to the rest of the day. And cortisol should be the highest in the morning. It's not the only thing that does this, but it is one of the hormones that helps you kind of get up and go. Now, the rest of the day, it's going to kind of flatten itself out, especially at Night is when we want it to flatten out because as melatonin goes up, we want the cortisol to be down and vice versa. These things don't mix too well together. If you have too high cortisol at night and uh, you're releasing melatonin, you're going to feel wired and tired. You might even get, excuse me, like I almost get a uh, like restless leg syndrome if I've ever oh, yeah. tried to take melatonin while traveling uh, because I'm trying to figure it out. I'm like, this was stupid. I shouldn't even have done this because I feel like crap now. And of course, if you had way too little cortisol in the morning, you would feel super fatigued upon waking up. You wouldn't feel like you have the get up and go necessary uh, to go throughout the day. So what we're seeing with our clients very often is you'll get a cortisol in the morning that is either tanked. Uh, occasionally, you'll see something that is way too high, but then maybe the rest of the day is tanked. I don't think, and this is fascinating, I don't think I have ever ran a test on a new client where they were actually in the acute phase. So that technically it's the second phase, but it's the first clinical phase, let's say, of HPA axis dysfunction because most people don't come to us at that time. Uh, the only time I've seen it actually was when I did a retest years later. I was mildly in the acute phase, which is, by the way, a really good thing when I started out in the exhaustive phase. So just curious, Lucy, have you ever actually seen a new client in the acute phase or is it always compensatory or exhaustive? Um, I, I actually have the majority um, are compensatory and um, the higher end of exhaustive, but I, I have seen a couple of clients um, in acute phase. I think I help people with mental health and I think Good you point. can still be having panic attacks <laughs> and uh, anxiety in acute phase. Um, so it's not common for me, but it, 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 I have seen it. Duh. Yeah, that's a fair point. And I almost like as I'm saying that, I'm like, oh my gosh, she works with people who have panic attacks sometimes. <laughs> yeah, but for the most part, they they are in, you know, at the very least compensatory uh, or exhaustive. Yeah, I could imagine with those clients, because we both experienced this, right? You can only go for so long with panic attacks before. I mean, you feel the exhaustion yes. afterwards. I can only imagine what's happening to the body after three months of this stuff. Like, I would have loved to have my hormones tested back in the day to see, like, what was 15-year-old Ev, what was his hormone output when I was having panic attacks daily for months yeah. on end? I, I don't know. Maybe I was already in uh, some of these deeper phases. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, I, and again, same as you, I would love to know. I would really love to know. But um, unfortunately, we never. I think I probably would have been quite low because I think my uh, I think my cortisol was just out of whack. And I think I was actually getting adrenaline and that was causing the the panic attacks. But this is I'm just guessing, which we don't do it after yet. <laughs> so. Yes. Um, I know that you wanted to talk about uh, kind of urine testing, but that's very popular on the market and how it's kind of like what's left over. So it's a little bit different. So do you want to touch on that now? Yeah. Um, so obviously there's a lot of everyone's, you know, there's a uh, urine test that is very popular. Um, we use, um, we use saliva at, uh, at FDN just because it is, is gold standard. We're not going to be knocking any, any tests or anything like that. Um, but it's just that, Saliva is considered a higher standard of testing than urine is. So that's what we like to stick with. We like to stick with the science. Um, and for us, saliva is the gold standard. I think too, and this is going to open up a can of worms, but I'm not going to get anything directly. So I'm just leaving it out there for people. <laughs> people need to understand the difference between good marketing and superior products. 
And what's interesting, forget functional medicine, I'm just talking about business in general. It's amazing how often you see some of the best places with the best marketing actually don't have the best product. And some of the places with the best product don't have the best marketing. And I hope I can say this. I hope they don't get mad. Like historically, the marketing side was always one of the issues with FDN. We've really only gotten this dial down over the last few years, and it's still certainly a work in progress. Um, You know, Reed was so busy taking care of the product and making sure it's this amazing thing that it's like funny for years, the vast majority of the people that came to FDN were other people or referred from other people who went through it and said, you got to check this out. It's so amazing. Um, and the example I always use for people, because this applies to labs, but anything in, in business and why you need to understand this from the testing perspective too, because you might've heard different things about what's the best form of testing for this or that. But again, this, is, this isn't even our opinion. This is the current up-to-date science as of 2024. Right. Um, my parents owned a small diner when I was a kid. And it was almost directly across the street from McDonald's. Now, my parents aren't or weren't at least super into like eating organic or anything like that. It was a standard diner, Uh, but you don't have to try very hard to have a better quality burger than McDonald's, right? Like if you just serve something that's 75% meat, you're already better off than McDonald's most likely. And yet who do you think sold more burgers every day? Well, all day long, McDonald's probably sold thousands. I wonder what the actual number is. I'm guessing it's thousands compared to maybe, maybe my parents sold like 40 or 50 at the higher end. It's most likely more something like 20 or 30 because we sold other things. But, but wait, they have a better burger though. And it's safer, costs about the same, better quality. What, what happened? Well, McDonald's is better at selling the burger. So what you need to watch out for in the lab space is there's a lot of places that are better at selling the labs than they are at creating a superior technology. So we have um, no affiliation or no pockets uh, or hands in our pockets of like fluids IQ or anything. In fact, we're the ones that recruited them to get uh, them to make something for us that works for us. So that's what we do at FDM. We kind of stay focused in the science with stuff. And we'll talk about that with a variety of other tests, like food sensitivity is a hugely nuanced one, but we use a very specific type of food sensitivity test for specific reasons. So getting a little bit ahead of myself. Um, did we miss anything from our notes today? I know that we covered most of these parts here. I think we, we covered it. This is- okay, cool. So then- Chilton's sweet. Yeah, well, the, don't make it that easy, right? I, I'd like to try to at least get to our 30 minute mark here so that these people have something cool. Uh, yeah, no, of course. Um, I, I, the, the thing I'll, I just want to add one point onto the um, urine versus saliva sure. testing. Um, again, we're not, you know, like Ev says, we're not like being paid or anything uh, by Fluids IQ. We have no affiliation other than, you know, we went to them, like he says. But um, one of the things with urine is it is your output. So it's not as uh, it's not the bioavailable um, levels. It's it's kind of like <laughs> like a car exhaust. Your urine is like a car exhaust. Like it's the output. It's for one of a better word, the crap that comes out. Um, and it's not always the most accurate for uh, testing for, for the for what we need. Um, again, it's another reason why we choose to go with saliva. The science is that we may not have the fancy marketing budget, um, but we do have the results. Right. I was trying to pull up uh, some test results for you guys. I just thought, I wish I thought about this beforehand. I'm like, it'd be kind of cool to share our results real quick. At least I have mine and we could show people some of this clinical correlation and how it all matches up. So let me see if I can find that right quick, Uh, because I'm looking at the sample that I shared here and it's like, I don't actually know that there would have been anything wildly significant wrong with that person. You know what I mean? Uh, Yeah, that looks a pretty on par. Uh, Like if that was mine, I'd be pretty happy with it. Um, To explain this to people, just in case we always want the, the actual, so you see that you've got the low marker at the bottom and then the high at the top, which is like the red dotted line. We want to see your circadian rhythm mapped in that. Um, that would be, that's like the perfect little uh, in the middle of the two, the two, the high end. There you go. Yeah, I got something for you guys. This is now. Yours? 
Yes. Yeah, so these are actually okay. um, my live results from retesting. So this would be an example of someone in, again, like I said, a very mild acute phase. If you even want to call it that, I mean, yellow is more of a warning as opposed to right. out of the reference range. So it actually looks like a really damn good pattern if I do say so myself. Um, but you know, if I saw this person as a client, because again, it was me at one time, I would maybe be wondering what's going on in the morning to spike this so high. But right. then if you look at how this goes, this actually is pretty solid. You see that at noon, it's a 0.7, uh, which is well within the reference range. And evening is a 0.63. So if anything, maybe you'd want to see like a little more decline going into yeah. the evening. But I mean, this is almost splitting hairs at this point. What you'd uh, really want to be concerned about is what's called a relative elevation. So uh, let's say on this graph here, my noon was a 0.5, still within the reference range, but it was a 0.5. And then my evening was a 0.7, which again would still be within the reference range. What we look at as FDNs is we say, okay, well, wait a second. Yes, these are both within the reference range, but this one relative to the other should be lower. It shouldn't mm -hmm. be higher. So what happened to this person between these two things that led to this relative elevation? Sometimes it could be something rather benign. Maybe it's like, oh, you know what? I just got home from being in traffic. I have an hour commute from work. And so I hate traffic. It freaks me out. I'm, I'm actually kind of a nervous driver. I got into an accident a year ago. And so I've always been stressed about it since then. Okay, that makes sense. That's not even a bad elevation considering that situation. But maybe you're like, no, you told me to kind of take a chill day, take some time off while I was doing this stuff. So, or doing this test rather. And I thought I was fine. That could imply maybe something going on with a food sensitivity, like maybe something that they ate ticked them off a little bit. So you can get some really interesting insights here. But I mean, Lucy, give it to me straight. What are you thinking about these results? <laughs> I mean, in a perfect world, I'd obviously want to see your morning cortisol slightly lower, like ideally obviously in the green mm -hmm. um i think your noon's looking pretty pretty good that's pretty spot on um and again perfect world i would want to see the evening slightly lower um just so we've got a bit of a more gentle sure. gentle curve rather than it kind of getting to the evening and then kind of just dropping um i've seen a lot worse than this so and i mean obviously this is a few years it was a few years ago a little, a little while this one ago. was in 2020 yeah okay yeah so yeah, it'd be interesting to to see what it is now, Ev. But I mean, overall, this this isn't bad. Um, and from what you you know you've told me and what you've been through, I think it's pretty good. And it also, if this was in 2020, you're probably doing better than most people. To be completely honest with you, um, yes. Well, and this is where, not to go too down the rabbit hole, but this is actually really important for all this stuff in our testing. This is why we never treat the paperwork we address right. the client. So I would be asking the client what's going on here with their life. And I do think this matters. This is crazy. I've shared this a few times on the podcast before, but we might be attracting a different audience here with the Lunch and Learn. So they might think it's a little far out. I did say already today, I'm very interested in light and circadian biology. And as you guys know, in the beginning of the pandemic, it certainly, it rewrote the rules of society and what you could get away with. So I was, my full-time thing was an FDN. I actually wasn't working at FDN in the beginning of 2020. I didn't start until November of 2020. And so I was no longer speaking at the time. That was my main thing. I was speaking in schools and the virtual thing hadn't started up yet. So I was basically kind of chilling, right? I could just kind of do what I needed to do. And so as someone who's interested in light, and Lucy, you might know this, you might not, I'm not sure. Do you know that I did a two month camping experiment at one point? No, I didn't know that. Perfect. I know you're interested, I know you're very interested in light, but I did not know about this. So I figured when the hell am I ever going to get another opportunity to do this? So I tell my parents I'm moving back home and they figure, oh, be pandemic, we totally get that. No problem. I said, well, yeah, I actually want to do it because you guys have three and a half acres and I'm going to camp. But they're like, what? Um, so what I was doing, though, is I only made it. It was like 53 out of the 60 days. Because seven days, there was like thunderstorms and stuff. The relevance to these results, though, is and I, I truly believe this. I'm not just trying to justify a slightly high morning cortisol, but I actually think this matters. We always talk about how flawed the sample sizes are are for, or not the sample size, I shouldn't say, but the samples in general from the population that we're testing, right? We know, this is not an opinion. We know when someone is out in morning light, their cortisol will raise as it should in the morning. Now, how many people to make these reference ranges on these charts, how many people do you actually think 
tested their cortisol after being in sunrise for two hours or an hour and a half, whatever it was, from the time that that thing went over to the horizon to the time that it was just like, you know, beautifully in the sky. I don't know. I think most people are doing this indoors. I think most people are doing this at the office or something like that. So I've always wondered, is it high or was I doing something out of the ordinary that made it so? I'm not sure. And then regarding the nighttime one, camping kind of scared me. There was a lot of animals that I could hear every night, Lucy. There was a coyote once that howled and scared the crap out of me at like 12 in the morning. I was a little nervous about this at this point. So it's like when you look at it relative to the person, is it possible that these slightly off results are because of otherwise benign things? Yes. And this is the things that we're trained to do as an FDN. You get trained how to think more than anything else, because these results actually might be close to perfect when you take into the other thing or take the other things into consideration. So now knowing that, do you, do you think that's justified or what? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, I would have so if I was your your FDN, I would have definitely asked you about the morning sample. Like, right. how did you wake up? Those kind of things. But yeah, I think you hit on a really good point. Like, bioindividuality is real. And what is normal for you? Like I, <laughs> that's never something like you going camping is like the most, like for 60, was it 60 days? 60 days. Yeah. That's the most ev story you've ever told me. <laughs> All right. And that got us to 30 minutes. That's perfect. So remember just in summary, we use saliva for a variety of reasons. It's not because there's never a time to use blood. It's not because there's never a time to use urine. One of the advantages of saliva is it's the easiest one to get four samples like this. So this is something really cool where you can see what's happening throughout the day very accurately with the person. And in this case, you know, I had a lot going on in my life at that time. There was a whole experiment going on. So it kind of matters for stuff like that. Right. We also talked about how blood is just impractical to do, you know, four times in a day. We talked about the active forms um, being available in saliva. And then you also mentioned some stuff with urine that I don't think I could recite as well. So do you want to just give the summary of that one as well? And uh, just with urine, it it is um it's not the bioavailable levels, it's what has come out essentially, is what is out of your body. Um, and there is more science to back saliva. So at FDM we follow the science, so we use saliva. Very cool. All right. So next time we will be back with you guys next Tuesday. I know it's not officially on our schedule yet, Lucy, but we will figure it out for you guys. We're going to be continuing along with the conversation around stress hormones, HPA access dysfunction, but we're also going to move into this topic of metabolic chaos, which is the singular, only one, uno, pseudo diagnosis we give out at FDN. So it's not a real diagnosis, but it's the one label that we have for all conditions here at FDN. And when you understand what metabolic chaos is, it is like this missing key to what to label the chronic illness uh, epidemic and why some people come into FDN with seven different diagnosed conditions like myself. It's not the seven different diagnosed conditions. It's metabolic chaos. And the good news is metabolic chaos is something that we can definitely support with the lab. So I'm looking forward to that one, Lucy. Me too. Me too. Cool. It's, it's going to be good. <laughs>